Biden warns against supplying offensive weapons to Israel for Rafah attack. In a significant move, President Joe Biden has declared that the United States will refrain from providing offensive weaponry to Israel for potential assaults on Rafah, a major stronghold of Hamas in Gaza. This announcement underscores Biden's concern for the safety of over one million civilians seeking refuge in Rafah. Speaking in an interview with CNN, Biden reaffirmed the U.S.'s its commitment to Israel's defense, but drew a clear line, stating that while defensive arms like Iron Dome rocket interceptors will be supplied, weapons conducive to all-out assaults on Rafah will not be provided. This marks a notable departure from the historic pattern of immense military aid extended to Israel by the U.S. The decision comes amidst mounting criticism over civilian casualties in Gaza, resulting from heavy bombs supplied by the U.S. Biden's acknowledgement of these casualties, coupled with the halt on a shipment of heavy bombs, underscores a growing divergence between the Biden administration and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government. While Biden emphasized that Israel's actions around Rafah have not yet crossed his red lines, he urged for greater measures to protect civilian lives in Gaza. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin confirmed the delay in weapons shipment, highlighting the ongoing review of security assistance in light of unfolding events in Rafah. This move coincides with the Biden administration's forthcoming evaluation of whether Israeli airstrikes on Gaza and aid restrictions have violated international and U.S. laws aimed at safeguarding civilians during conflicts. Such a decision could potentially amplify pressure on Biden to curtail military support to Israel. The decision to pause the weapons shipment has drawn mixed reactions, with Israel's ambassador to the United Nations expressing disappointment and frustration. Republican leaders have criticized the move, while voices from the left argue for a more substantial shift in U.S. policy towards Israel. Biden's administration has signaled a preference for more precise operations in conflict zones, advocating for the use of smaller, precision weapons over larger bombs that risk collateral damage. The seizure of Gaza's vital Rafah border crossing by Israeli troops has further heightened tensions, prompting scrutiny from the international community. While the pause in weapons shipment may be largely symbolic, it signals a potential shift in U.S.-Israel relations and underscores Biden's efforts to assert diplomatic influence over Israeli actions. As the situation in Rafah continues to unfold, the Biden administration faces mounting pressure to navigate a delicate balance between supporting Israel's security and addressing humanitarian concerns in Gaza. Biden's decision to pause bomb shipment to Israel sparks GOP outrage. President Joe Biden's recent move to halt a shipment of heavy bombs to Israel has ignited a firestorm of criticism from Republican lawmakers, further polarizing U.S. efforts to influence Israel's actions in southern Gaza. The decision to withhold approximately 30,500 bombs already approved for delivery comes amid mounting concern within the Biden administration regarding the civilian toll in Gaza and apprehensions about a potential full-scale Israeli invasion of Rafah, a city housing over a million Palestinians seeking refuge. While progressives have long advocated for restrictions on arms shipments to Israel, Republicans have responded with vehement condemnation of Biden's actions. House Foreign Affairs Committee Chair Rep. Zetter Michael McCall, Texas, and House Armed Services Chair Rep. Mike Rogers, R. Allah, issued a joint statement expressing their dismay, labeling the decision as a weakening of Israeli security and criticizing the lack of transparency surrounding the move. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin faced tough questioning from Republican senators during his testimony before the Senate Appropriations Committee with Senator Jerry Moran, R. Can expressing concern that withholding weapons could send the wrong message to Israel's enemies. The weapons currently on hold include 2,000-pound and 500-pound bombs, as well as joint direct attack munitions kits that convert them into precision-guided munitions. The decision reflects a broader re-evaluation of security assistance in light of evolving developments in Rafah. Despite assurances of an ironclad commitment to Israel's security from the Biden administration, Republican lawmakers remain critical of what they perceive as a departure from unwavering support for Israel. They argue that withholding weapons could embolden Hamas and other Iranian-backed groups committed to Israel's destruction.
Israel, too, has expressed disappointment over the decision, with Ambassador Gilad Erdan calling it frustrating and a very disappointing decision. The move comes amidst escalating tensions as Israel initiated limited operations in Rafah, ordering the evacuation of 100,000 Palestinians and seizing control of vital border crossings. Biden, speaking to CNN, hinted at further repercussions if Israel were to escalate its actions in Rafah, indicating a willingness to halt offensive weapons sales in such an event. The Biden administration's stance reflects growing concerns over the humanitarian crisis in Gaza and a desire for Israel to define an endgame to the conflict. As the death toll rises in Gaza, Democrats have also joined the call for action, with Senator Bernie Sanders, IV, commending Biden's decision, but urging for more comprehensive steps to address the humanitarian disaster. Republicans, however, argue that Biden's actions risk undermining America's support for Israel and could embolden its adversaries. Senator Tommy Tuberville, our ally, accused the president of capitulating to the America-hating fringe of the Democratic Party, while others questioned the wisdom of using weapon shipments as leverage against Israel rather than against Hamas. Amidst these divisions, the Biden administration faces mounting pressure to navigate a delicate balance between supporting Israel's security and addressing humanitarian concerns in Gaza, with the outcome likely to have significant implications for U.S. foreign policy in the region. U.S. reviews additional military aid to Israel amidst halting shipment. The United States has announced a review of further pending military aid to Israel, following the recent pause in a weapons shipment to the close ally, according to the State Department on Wednesday. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin confirmed earlier during congressional testimony that one shipment of high payload munitions had been halted, corroborating reports in U.S. media. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller stated that other deliveries were now under scrutiny. We have paused one shipment of near-term assistance and we are reviewing others, he told reporters, emphasizing that the long-term commitment to Israel's security remained unchanged. Miller declined to specify the type of military aid affected or the duration of the interruption, citing ongoing reviews. He stressed that U.S. policy determinations were contingent upon Israel's own policy decisions. The focus of U.S. concern, according to Miller, was the situation in Rafah, a southern city in Gaza viewed as the last place of refuge for civilians. The U.S. government has made it clear that it does not support a large-scale military offensive in Rafah and has called for a credible plan from Israel to ensure the protection of civilian populations and humanitarian supplies. The announcement comes amidst heightened tensions in the region and reflects a broader reassessment of U.S. policy towards Israel in light of recent developments. As the situation continues to evolve, the outcome of these deliberations could have significant implications for the future of U.S.-Israel relations and broader Middle East dynamics. Hamas rejects further compromise with Israel amidst ceasefire negotiations. In the latest development in the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas, the Palestinian militant group Hamas has declared its unwillingness to make additional concessions to Israel in ceasefire negotiations. Despite talks being held in Cairo aimed at pausing Israel's seven-month offensive in Gaza, Hamas maintains its stance, signaling a potential deadlock in negotiations. Israel has continued tank and aerial strikes on the southern Gaza city of Rafah, heightening tensions in the region. The threat of a major assault on Rafah looms large as Israeli forces move in via the Rafah border crossing with Egypt, cutting off a vital aid route and the only exit for the evacuation of wounded patients. Izat El Rashik, a member of Hamas's political office in Qatar, stated that the group would not exceed the ceasefire proposal it accepted on Monday. This proposal includes the release of some Israeli hostages in Gaza and Palestinian women and children detained in Israel. Rashik accused Israel of using negotiations as a pretext to invade Rafah and occupy the crossing, casting doubt on Israel's commitment to reaching an agreement. While Hamas remains steadfast in its position, there has been no immediate comment from Israel on the latest developments. However, Israel had previously declared Hamas's three-phase proposal as unacceptable due to perceived watering down of terms. Delegations from Hamas, Israel, the U.S., Egypt, and Qatar have been engaged in talks in Cairo since Tuesday. Despite the efforts, there has been little progress, 
with Hamas rejecting further compromise and Israel continuing its military operations in Gaza. The United States, a key player in the negotiations, has expressed optimism about a potential deal. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan stated that there is a pathway to a deal and urged both sides to work towards an agreement. However, the U.S. aims to prevent a full-scale Israeli invasion of Rafah, with reports indicating that a shipment of bombs to Israel has been paused to exert pressure on Israel to de-escalate the situation. As the conflict persists, concerns mount over the humanitarian crisis unfolding in Gaza. The UN, Gaza residents, and humanitarian groups warn of a catastrophic situation if Israeli incursions into Rafah continue. The lack of fuel and aid entering Gaza exacerbates the dire conditions, with shortages of food, water, and medicine reported. With casualties mounting and civilian infrastructure in ruins, calls for international intervention grow louder. However, a resolution to the conflict remains elusive as both sides dig in their heels, prolonging the suffering of innocent civilians caught in the crossfire. UK arms export policy to Israel differs from US approach, says Foreign Secretary Cameron. British Foreign Secretary David Cameron has highlighted the differences between the United Kingdom's system of arms exports to Israel and that of the United States. Cameron emphasized that while the U.S. is a significant supplier of weapons to Israel, the U.K.'s sales are comparatively small and subject to rigorous oversight. In response to inquiries about whether the U.K. would follow the U.S. in withholding weapons from Israel, particularly in the event of a major invasion of Rafah, Cameron stressed the distinctiveness of the U.K.'s approach. He underscored that the U.K. government does not have a comprehensive supply of weapons to Israel but rather issues a limited number of licenses for arms exports, which constitute a fraction of Israel's total weaponry. The U.S. is a massive state supplier of weapons to Israel. We do not have a U.K. government supply of weapons to Israel. We have a number of licenses, and I think our defense exports to Israel are responsible for significantly less than 1% of their total, Cameron stated following a speech. Cameron's remarks come amid heightened scrutiny of arms sales to Israel in light of the ongoing conflict in Gaza. The UK government's policy on arms exports reflects a commitment to strict procedures and accountability, ensuring that exported weapons are used responsibly and in compliance with international humanitarian law. As discussions surrounding arms sales continue, Cameron's delineation of the UK's approach serves to clarify the country's stance on the matter and underscores the importance of transparency and oversight in the arms trade. Turkey denies easing trade ban with Israel amidst claims of policy shift. Turkey's trade minister Omar Bolat dismissed Israeli claims of Ankara easing its trade ban with Israel as absolutely fictional and have nothing to do with reality. Bolat's statement comes as Turkey introduces a three-month reprieve for companies with existing export deals to Israel, emphasizing that the trade ban remains in place until certain conditions are met. Last week, Turkey announced a halt on all exports and imports to and from Israel, citing the worsening humanitarian tragedy in the Palestinian territories. Despite Israeli foreign minister's assertions that Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan had lifted many trade restrictions, Bolat reaffirmed Turkey's stance on the matter. According to Bolat, Turkey's trade ban with Israel will only be lifted once a permanent ceasefire in Gaza is secured and humanitarian aid flows to the region. The three-month reprieve outlined by the Turkish Trade Ministry allows companies to fulfill existing orders via third countries, but it does not signal a relaxation of the ban on exports to Israel. The move to introduce a reprieve aims to protect Turkish traders, according to sources from the Turkish Trade Ministry. Erdogan had previously assured Turkish business people that Ankara would manage problems arising from the trade halt with Israel through coordination and dialogue with the business community. Turkey's Presidency's Communications Directorate also refuted claims of easing the trade ban with Israel, labeling them as attempts to manipulate international public opinion. As Turkey maintains its position, the situation underscores the complexities surrounding trade relations between the two countries amidst ongoing geopolitical tensions in the region. Iran intensifies crackdown on women defying dress code, rights advocates say.
Iran has launched a significant new crackdown on women who defy the country's strict dress code, deploying large numbers of police to enforce laws mandating the wearing of headscarves in public, according to human rights advocates. The campaign, dubbed the Noor Light Campaign by Iranian officials, is aimed at enforcing the country's mandatory hijab law, which requires women to cover their heads and the shape of their bodies. This crackdown marks the most serious effort yet by the regime to reassert its authority after women-led protests in 2022 and 2023 challenged the mandatory hijab law. Amnesty International has condemned the effort as a war on women, stating that security forces across the country have intensified their violent enforcement of compulsory veiling. The protests, known as the Women Life Freedom Movement erupted following the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini in 2022 after she was detained for allegedly not adhering to the mandatory headscarf law. Hadi Gami, the executive director of the Center for Human Rights in Iran, warned of potential tragic consequences, stating that the police operation significantly increases the threat of unchecked state violence against women and girls. Tehran Police Chief Abbasali Mohammadian announced the operation on state TV on April 13th, coinciding with Iran's drone and missile attack on Israel. The United Nations Human Rights Office has expressed concern over the crackdown, noting reports of widespread arrests and harassment of women and girls, as well as the closure of businesses and restaurants for allegedly failing to enforce the hijab law. A young fact-finding mission concluded that Iran is responsible for the physical violence that killed Amini and committed crimes against humanity in its violent repression of subsequent protests. However, Iran has denied responsibility for Amini's death and rejected accusations of crushing peaceful protests with violence. As the crackdown continues, human rights organizations and international observers closely monitor the situation expressing alarm over the escalating repression faced by women and girls in Iran. Ukrainian president urges increased arms supply to halt Russian advances. In a joint news conference with the European Parliament's visiting president, Roberta Metzola, Ukrainian president Volodymyr Zelensky emphasized the urgent need for increased arms supply from allied countries to stop Russian forces advancing in the east of Ukraine. Zelensky stressed the critical role of enhanced weapon deliveries, stating that with increased arms supply, Ukraine could effectively halt Russian forces, which currently hold the initiative in the eastern regions of the country. He highlighted the perilous situation faced by Ukrainian forces with depleted resources and a pressing need for weapons and ammunition. The Ukrainian leader's remarks came amidst escalating tensions as air raid sirens blared in the capital, Kiev, signaling the ongoing threat of Russian missile and drone attacks across the country. Zelensky condemned Russia's actions, emphasizing the stark reality of living under the constant threat of conflict. Acknowledging the need for additional troops, Zelensky underscored the importance of equipping newly arriving brigades to hold back Russian forces. He urged for expedited aid deliveries, emphasizing that time is of the essence in the face of ongoing Russian aggression. While Zelensky welcomed the recent approval of a significant military aid bill by the U.S., he noted that many units in Ukraine have yet to receive new arms. He emphasized the need for increased domestic production of drones and artillery shells, highlighting their crucial role in Ukraine's defense against Russian attacks. As Ukraine continues to grapple with the escalating conflict in the East, Zelensky's calls for increased international support underscore the gravity of the situation and the urgent need for concerted action to counter Russian advances. Philippines assures economic resilience amid sea tensions with China. The Philippines has asserted that despite escalating tensions with Beijing over territorial disputes in the South China Sea, the nation's economy remains resilient and open to collaboration with Chinese investors. Economic Planning Secretary Arsenio Balasakin affirmed that geopolitical tensions have not significantly impacted the country's economic stability. His remarks followed the government's report of first quarter growth at 5.7%, slightly below projections, but still showing overall momentum. While tensions between the Philippines and China have heightened in recent months due to competing claims in the South China Sea, Balisakan emphasized that the Philippines maintains openness to cooperation with Chinese investors. 
He noted that previous issues, such as the cancellation of Chinese financing for railway projects, were due to funding constraints rather than geopolitical disputes. Balasakan reiterated the Philippines' commitment to maintaining amicable relations with China, highlighting that the nation does not seek to disadvantage Chinese investors. Despite ongoing disputes, the Philippines remains receptive to private investment from China, emphasizing its dedication to fostering economic growth and development. In the face of geopolitical challenges, the Philippines' affirmation of economic resilience and openness to collaboration with Chinese investors signals a commitment to maintaining stability and fostering economic prosperity. Economic dynamics shift as U.S. becomes Germany's top trading partner. In a significant shift, the United States has surpassed China to become Germany's leading trading partner in the first quarter of this year, marking a notable change in global economic dynamics. According to calculations based on official data from the German Statistics Office, trade between Germany and the United States, encompassing both exports and imports, totaled 63 billion euros, 68 billion, from January to March. In comparison, trade with China amounted to just under 60 billion euros during the same period. Economists attribute this shift to multiple factors. Vincent Stamer, an economist at Commerce Bank, points to the robust U.S. economy as a driver of increased German exports to the U.S., while trade with China has seen a decline. Stamer also highlights structural changes, noting that China has ascended the value chain, producing more sophisticated goods domestically and reducing its reliance on German imports. Moreover, German companies are increasingly opting to produce goods, goods locally rather than exporting them to China. Germany's desire to reduce its dependency on China has also played a role in this shift. While Berlin has expressed concerns about political differences and unfair practices by Beijing, concrete policy steps to reduce dependencies remain vague. Jürgen Mathis from the German Economic Institute IW underscores the economic performance of the U.S. and China as contributing factors. German imports from China dropped nearly 12% year-on-year in the first quarter, while exports to China declined slightly over 1%. Mathis suggests that the relatively stronger U.S. economy compared to China's may have influenced this trend. Currently, the U.S. accounts for approximately 10% of German goods exports, while China's share has decreased to less than 6%. Mathis suggests a geopolitical reorientation away from China towards the U.S., driven by global economic challenges and geopolitical considerations. However, uncertainties remain about the sustainability of this trend. Dirk Yandura president of the BGA Trade Association, highlights the potential impact of changes in U.S. administration post-elections in November, suggesting that shifts in policy could influence the trajectory of German-U.S. trade relations. Overall, the shift in Germany's top trading partner underscores evolving global economic dynamics and the complex interplay of factors shaping international trade relationships. Chinese warship visit to Cambodia raises concerns amid U.S. apprehensions. China's announcement of plans to send two warships to Cambodia and East Timor for training purposes has stirred concerns, particularly in the United States, about the growing Chinese presence, especially at Cambodia's Reem Naval Base. The Chinese Defense Ministry disclosed that the naval training ship Chijiguang and the amphibious warfare ship Jingangshan would embark on a voyage from May to mid-June to engage in training exercises with local naval cadets aiming to strengthen mutual trust between the country's navies. The amphibious warfare ship, Jingangshan, boasts capabilities to transport helicopters, armored vehicles, and nearly 1,000 troops, while Chijiguang represents China's most technologically advanced military training vessel. Although China did not specify the exact locations where the vessels would be stationed during their visit, the prospect of Chinese warships at Cambodia's Ream Naval Base raises alarms in Washington. The recent expansion of Ream Naval Base, supported by China, has prompted concerns that it could provide Beijing with a strategic foothold near the disputed South China Sea. Before China's involvement, Ream had hosted joint naval training exercises between the United States and Cambodia. However, Cambodia's decision to allow China to develop the base coupled with the demolition of a U.S.-built facility in 2020, has strained relations with Washington. Since December, two Chinese warships, potentially corvettes or frigates, have been stationed at Ream Naval Base.
Cambodia's defense ministry asserts that their presence does not signify a permanent deployment of the Chinese military. China has been actively bolstering its ties with Cambodia, characterized by frequent high-level state and military exchanges. In March, Chinese Defense Minister Dong Jun met with senior Cambodian military officials in Beijing, reaffirming commitments to enhance military cooperation between the two nations. U.S. revokes export licenses for Intel and Qualcomm, impacting Huawei's supply chain. The United States has revoked licenses that permitted companies like Intel and Qualcomm to supply chips used in laptops and handsets to Huawei Technologies, according to sources familiar with the matter. This move is expected to have significant implications for both Huawei and its American suppliers. The revocation of these licenses, effective immediately for some companies as of Tuesday, follows pressure from Republican lawmakers urging tougher action against Huawei. The U.S. Commerce Department, while confirming the license revocation, did not specify the companies affected. This decision comes shortly after Huawei's launch of its first AI-enabled laptop, the MateBook X Pro, powered by Intel's new Core Ultra 9 processor, which drew criticism from Republican lawmakers. Republican Congresswoman Elise Stefanik stated that this action would bolster U.S. national security and protect American innovation while diminishing China's technological advancement. The move is likely to impact Huawei, which heavily relies on Intel chips for its laptops and could also affect U.S. suppliers doing business with the Chinese company. The Chinese Foreign Ministry has condemned the U.S. for abusing export controls to suppress Chinese companies. Despite being placed on a U.S. trade restriction list in 2019, Huawei's suppliers have received licenses worth billions of dollars to continue selling to the company. One controversial authorization issued by the Trump administration allowed Intel to ship central processors to Huawei for use in its laptops since 2020. Qualcomm, another key supplier, has sold older 4G chips to Huawei handsets under a license received in 2020. However, Qualcomm's patent deal with Huawei is set to expire and negotiations for renewal have commenced. Critics argue that such licenses have contributed to Huawei's resurgence evident in its smartphone sales spike and significant revenue growth in its smart car component business. The U.S. decision to revoke these licenses signals a further escalation in the ongoing technological and trade tensions between the U.S. and China, impacting key players in the global supply chain. Baron Trump selected as Florida delegate for Republican National Convention. Former President Donald Trump's youngest son, Barron Trump, is set to make his political debut as a delegate to the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee this July. The 18-year-old high school senior will represent Florida as one of 41 at-large delegates, according to Republican Party of Florida Chairman Evan Power. While Barron has mostly remained out of the public eye, his upcoming role marks a significant step into the political arena. Born in March 2006, Barron celebrated his 18th birthday earlier this year and is graduating from high school next week. Notably, a judge overseeing one of Donald Trump's legal cases in New York has adjusted the court schedule to accommodate Trump's attendance at Barron's graduation on May 17th. Joining Barron in the Florida delegation are his siblings, Donald Trump Jr., Eric Trump, and Tiffany Trump, reflecting a family presence in the Republican Party's activities. Power emphasized the diversity of the delegation, comprising grassroots leaders, elected officials, and members of the Trump family, highlighting their collective commitment to the GOP's agenda. Barron Trump's inclusion as a delegate underscores the ongoing influence of the Trump family within Republican circles and their active participation in shaping the party's future. Majority of voters predict Trump conviction in NY trial, poll shows. A recent Suffolk University USA Today poll of registered voters reveals that nearly two-thirds believe former President Donald Trump will be found guilty on some charges in his ongoing criminal trial in New York City. The unprecedented trial marks the first in the nation's history for a former or current president. Trump faces nearly three dozen state felony charges related to falsifying business records concerning payments made during the 2016 election to adult film actress Stormy Daniels, also known as Stephanie Clifford, to silence allegations of an affair. While Trump has consistently denied the accusations and charges, half of those surveyed anticipate a conviction on some, but not all counts. 
15% predict a conviction on all counts, ref, while 23% believe Trump will be found not guilty on all charges. The poll underscores differing perceptions of fairness surrounding the trial, with 44% of respondents expressing skepticism about its fairness to date. Partisan divisions are stark, with the majority of Democrats viewing the trial as fair, while most Republicans perceive it as unjust. Independents are evenly split on the matter. Despite the legal proceedings, Trump has repeatedly criticized the trial's fairness and its participants, including prosecutors, the judge, and witnesses. New York Supreme Court Judge Juan Merchant recently found Trump in contempt multiple times for violating a gag order, prompting warnings of potential jail time if violations persist. Trump and his defense team argue that the gag order infringes on his First Amendment rights. The trial's implications extend beyond the courtroom, with Trump's legal battles potentially affecting his political future. As Trump navigates the trial, it intersects with his ongoing political activities, including a potential rematch with President Biden in the 2024 election. Conducted from April 30th to May 3rd, the Suffolk University poll surveyed 1,000 registered voters nationwide, with a margin of error of plus or minus 3.1 percentage points. Trump advocates keeping FBI in D.C. proposes capital city rebuilding plan. Former President Donald Trump recently announced via Truth Social that retaining the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, in Washington, D.C. would be a focal point of his agenda if elected for a second term. Trump opposes the Biden administration's proposal to split the FBI between D.C. and a new site in Greenbelt, Maryland. In his statement, Trump emphasized the importance of centralizing the FBI in Washington, D.C., near the Department of Justice, DOJ headquarters, to enhance collaboration between the two agencies. He argued that proximity facilitates more effective coordination and communication, crucial for combating crime in the nation's capital. Trump linked the FBI's presence in D.C. to efforts to address rising crime rates in the city, attributing the surge to inadequate law enforcement and infrastructure. He asserted that relocating the FBI to Maryland would impede swift action against crime, advocating for a stronger, safer D.C. Throughout his message, Trump reiterated accusations against the FBI and DOJ, alleging biased actions against him and his administration. He framed the ongoing legal proceedings against him, including 34 felony counts related to New York business records, as politically motivated attacks orchestrated by the Biden administration. Trump's statements reflect his combative stance against the trial, which he has denounced as a scam and a witch hunt. He contends that the trial disrupts his political activities and family life, characterizing it as an attempt to hinder his potential candidacy in the 2024 presidential election. As Trump navigates legal challenges and political ambitions, his proposals regarding the FBI's location and broader plans for capital city redevelopment underscore his ongoing engagement with national issues and priorities. Trump-affiliated group proposes America First National Security Agenda in New Policy Book. A new policy book from the America First Policy Institute aimed at shaping a potential second Trump administration's national security agenda outlines a vision centered on prioritizing American interests. Here are the key proposals outlined in the book. One, military aid to Ukraine. The book suggests making future military aid to Ukraine contingent on the country's participation in peace talks with Russia. It anticipates Ukraine's potential loss of ground over time and advises against providing arms indefinitely without progress in negotiations. 2. China Policy Describing China as the most pressing national security threat, the book advocates for a hawkish approach. It proposes reciprocal measures to restrict Beijing's access to U.S. markets and recommends banning Chinese nationals from buying property within a 50-mile radius of U.S. government buildings. 3. Cybersecurity and Tech Screening The book calls for rigorous screening of cyber and tech companies owned by U.S. adversaries, particularly China, to safeguard sensitive information. It also suggests visa restrictions on Chinese students and banning Chinese apps like TikTok over data privacy concerns. 4. Transition Preparation Reflecting on the tumultuous transition of 2016-2017, the book emphasizes the need for better preparation in filling national security-related positions. 
it urges the next administration to prioritize appointing Trump loyalists who adhere to the America First approach. Number five, Israel Focus, one chapter authored by Ellie Kohenim. A former Trump Deputy State Department envoy proposes bolstering Israel's military capabilities with advanced weaponry like F-35s and F-15EX fighters. It also suggests redirecting military funding to Israel and advocating for Arab states to support Gaza's reconstruction. The book aims to provide an intellectual foundation for an America-first approach to national security, emphasizing strategies over policies. While it aligns with Trump's agenda, the group stresses its independence from his campaign. Despite lacking specific details in some areas, the book sets out a vision for reshaping U.S. foreign policy with a focus on protecting American interests.